Hello, everybody, and thank you so much once again for attending Hacker Halted 2021. My name is David Sanchez, and it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our next speaker. So after serving 23 years in the United States Air Force and building a retail business, Matthew Heath Van Horn now works as an assistant professor of information technology at the State University of New York. He has served as hacker and referee for or for regional collegiate cyber defense, uh, sorry about that, competitions for the last five years. And his goal is to fuel the future of the cyber world. His talk is gonna be on cyber dogfight. So with no further ado, it's my pleasure to present Mr. Matthew Heath Van Hoor. Thank you so much. So uh, this is about my dissertation that I wrote, and it was a very interesting uh, path, and I think it is something that should be shared with other uh, cybersecurity experts. So I am presenting this as the way it unfolded, so that way you can understand uh, what I am trying to discuss. I consider cyber to be very reminiscent of the fighter planes of World War I, uh, when aircraft first took flight and became a war fighting entity, people were uh, doing everything they could with them. They tried to make bigger planes and smaller planes, more robust planes, better guns, uh, planes that could take more damage, uh, faster, ones that could die, ones that could climb. And it was very much um, uh, wild, wild west when it came to aircraft. And it was a brand new dimension in uh, how uh, wars were fought. So uh, when I look at cyber, I look at cyber as a dimension that is brand new. Even though it's been around for a while, most of us have been in cyber for you know, a few decades. But every day, it seems like something new is happening. Something new is being built. Some new technique is being tried. And that makes things uh, interesting in our environment. So to me, the comparisons are pretty similar. Right now, the cost of cybercrime is in the billions. The drug costs in tens of billions of dollars just for stolen identities, uh, ransomware, theft. It was nearing 1% of every nation's GDP and the losses are increasing. The indirect costs are even more than that. They're about 10 times more than the direct cost, which includes stock prices, uh, lawsuits, and disgruntled customers. And so you would think that us cyber professionals would do something to stop this, but we've tried. When I was doing research, uh, I found that uh, cyber defenders, uh, security professionals, focused on three main areas. The first was technology. Why? Because we like technology. Technology is awesome. Um, I love technology. I love learning new stuff all the time. But we focused on technology and we focused on marketing. This piece of technology will save our medicine. This piece of technology will keep us from running out of space in the, in the server room. This piece of technology will stop you know, pay attacks. This te technology will stop, um, you know, uh, email, spreading viruses, whatever. We came up with all kinds of new technology, practitioners and academics alike, and we said, this will work. This will solve our problem. We've been doing this for 35 years, and now, over the last few years, I mean, even 10 years ago when I started this research, uh, when I started this, when I mentioned that technology does not solve problems, uh, people would argue with me night and day. Now, people are starting to understand that the technology is only a piece. And that, yes, we know technology will help us in certain situations, but still the human component that requires uh, assistance. So another area that people thought of is like, well, if technology is not going to do it, let's get the law. If only we can pass some laws to get uh, hackers to stop this. They would fear the law. They would stop attacking if they thought that things were going to uh, oh, you got scratch the audio.
Chelsea, one, two, three, can you hear me? I got a message without scratchy out of here. Okay, so is it, is it working? Okay. So I'll, I'll continue on. If it continues to be a problem, please say something. All right. But so we said, hey, we'll pass a law. You know, uh, when it's making against the law, you can't hack companies. You can't steal people's information. We, you can't uh, set up a, a, a botnet to attack people. You know, we'll pass all these laws, except one part that we don't have still coming in scratchy. Test one, two, three. Test one, two, three. Can you hear that? Is that better? Testing one, two, three, four. This is a test of the National Broadcast Association. Okay, and it's not scratching anymore. All right, so I'll continue on. So we, uh, so we figured we'd make these laws, except hackers, they're not scared of the law, right? So over the time, I, I studied all these laws that we put in place. I studied the effects of the laws. Um, it has had no influence on stemming hacker activity because there's two things. One, hackers don't think they're going to be caught because the likelihood is really, really low. And two, if they do get caught, and even if they do go to jail, they get out, start their own firm, and now they're multi-millionaires and consulting. So it is not a deterrent to hacker activity to any greater or lesser degree. So the other field was psychology. If you could only figure out, people were losing their minds, if you could only figure out why hackers do this hacking, why do they do this? This is crazy. And I gotta tell you guys in psychology, I'm not a psychology guy, but I can tell you why hackers do it. It's fun. 30 years of research, and I can tell, answer that question for you. It's fun. That's why they like to do it. I know that's why I like to practice new stuff. I think it's great. So we studied this problem from three different areas for decades. And we gotta do something different because after 30 years, capital is growing faster than it ever has. This is becoming not only a business model uh, in a sense of pride, and it's gone from where people are deliberately being malicious for profit. And it's not slowing down. So all this research that we've done for 30 years, it's time for another direction. It's time for something new. And so when I was doing all this uh, reading of all these journals and, and everything, I just kind of went, okay, I need to take a break and think of this problem from a different situation. Now, I'm a movie fanatic, and here are two movies that I watched during my break, and both of them identified the exact same problem that we're having now. And so I'm going to walk you through this thought process, and then I'll walk you through a little bit of research. So remember, it's a movie. you got good guys and bad guys. The good guys have to be identified quickly so we can cheer them on. we got to identify the bad guys quickly so we can cheer when they are destroyed. So if you simplify the cyberspace into hackers and defenders, what we can do is we can identify what makes them defenders and attackers. Defenders typically have teams, they've got consultants, they've got vendors, they've got uh, large budgets. If, they, if, they have, if they're protecting anything important, they better have a large budget. And they are facing, facing minimal risk. Uh, there's like 1.2 million jobs out there for security defenders, uh, security professionals right now. So even if the company goes under, uh, they can get a job fairly quickly, and they're certainly not going to face any problem with law because they're the defenders. They're the aggrieved party. 
The attackers, on the other hand, have fewer resources, and of course, you know, there's the criminal organizations and the state-sponsored organizations, but generally, hackers that are learning how to do stuff, they have very few resources, they have a small, if they have any, budget, and they're facing the maximum risk, because they can go to jail. So we have these two different parties fighting it out in, in cyberspace. So if we go to the first movie, you know, it's about, uh, the 300 is about the battle of Thermopylae. And when we look at that, when we think about what actually happened, you know, the movie was a dramatization, which is fine, it's an enjoyable movie. I certainly wouldn't use it to write a historical thesis. Am I still scratching? Okay. Let's see here. Let's switch to different mic. Is that a better uh, microphone? Testing one, two, three, one, two, three. Okay. So much better. Okay, that's great. All right, so we solved that problem. Um, so the thing is, when we have this, uh, we when you look at the Battle of Thermopylae. It was 300 Spartans, you know, the movie 300, and about 6,000 Greeks versus between 100,000 and 200,000 Persians. They don't have better numbers than that. That's what we have from the history. However, the death rate between the defenders, which had very few people, and the attackers was 20 to 1. The defenders defeated the attackers. There's no way they should have stood up for two minutes, but they stood up for three days preventing these folks. And that should never have happened. That's why we still tell this epic story 2,500 years later. So that's pretty amazing. In a more modern context, we got the Korean Air War. And that came from Top Gun, where they was telling why Top Gun was established, why that was built. It's because uh, at the time, uh, we got too reliant on missiles and we couldn't dogfight anymore. But what was interesting is they mentioned the Korean Air War. And the Korean Air War, the MiG-15, was an amazing aircraft. The Russians had the technological advantage. They had a very maneuverable aircraft. It could climb, climb fast and high. It had a high ceiling. And it had heavy guns. The, the United States basically had a brick with an engine on it. It couldn't climb, it couldn't fly high. The only advantage it had was a radar gun sight and there's still debate whether how good that was. Um, but yet the Americans defeated the Russians at a ratio of 10 to one. They should not have been able to do that. Everything pointed that they should not be able to do that. Just like right now, defenders with all their resources should not be subject to hackers attacking their systems. There's tons of examples. In ancient history, you got the Battle of Marathon. That was 10,000 people versus 100,000 people and 1,000 cavalry. And they still defeated them at a ratio of 11 to 1. The Battle of Cannae, that was 50,000 versus 100,000 Romans, which had every piece of technological advantage of the time available to them. And the Romans lost at a ratio of 19 to one. Stirling Bridge, a bunch of Scottish infantry took on the English longbow and cavalry, the best trained army in the world at the time, and they lost. They don't know what the, what the death rate was, but there was still no way that uh, a regular infantry should be able to take on a technologically advanced force. There are more modern examples. You got the Zulus, who attacked the English with spears and leather shields, and they got a one-to-one -one advantage, even though they're fighting a, a people that had breech loader guns, which should be able to mow people down like nobody's business, and they were unable to. The English were defeated. The Gulf War in 91, and I know some people remember that, some people don't, but I was in the Air Force at that time, and we were scared. I mean, not scared like, oh my goodness, quiver in our boots, but it was hesitant. 
we were taking on the fourth largest army in the world on their home turf. Yeah, we had some trepidation about that, but yet we were able to defeat them at a ratio of 10 to one. Then, this is my, my guy here. I really enjoyed him when he did this. Uh, Lieutenant General Paul Van Ripper. Uh, there was the largest military exercise that the United States was ever part of in 2002 called Millennium Challenge 2002. It was supposed to demonstrate uh, the war fighting capability of the United States against another force. And we were not only using our current weapons, but weapons that we think would be around in five years. Van Ripper, he used wooden boats. He used bicycling or motorcycling messengers to transmit orders. And he defeated the entire United States forces in one day at a ratio of 20 to one. He destroyed so much equipment after the end of one day, they had to stop. He even included sinking the American aircraft carrier. And he did this at a ratio of 20 to one. There is no way he should have won. And he not only won, he destroyed them. So we need, there's something here. So I looked at decision-making at this point and the decision-making uh, predictors and models that were all in there and, the, and that were available at the time all fell on this kind of spectrum. I made a composite model based on everything that I knew. It's got MBTI, it's got learning theory, it's got all that stuff in there. And the decision-making is on a scale. So you can do um, fall in the intuitive range, or you can fall in the rational range, or you can follow somewhere in between. And so that makes things interesting if you have a range of outcomes to choose from. So I applied all that research and went through another couple hundred articles again to see who spoke about decision making. And I found uh, material where they talked about it, where they spoke about it. But this is what I found, that people in the IT field studying this problem with hackers, they would measure the inputs to the decision making to include, you know, hey, deter this, resources, technology, ethics, that sort of thing. They'd look at the inputs to the decision making, or they would look at the outputs of decision making. They would say, how much did we lose? How much did it cost? What happened to our reputation? Uh, we need new laws. Uh, what happened? But nobody would actually look at the dynamic decision-making. So I drew dynamic decision-making as a black box. It's a mystery that nobody would open. And so this, I think, is the crux of the hacker versus defender problem, is what's in this black box. Now. I wasn't the only person who thought of this. There was a guy that came way before me, but he was trying to answer a different problem. I'm trying to answer a hacker problem. Uh, this guy, John Boyd, he was trying to uh, deal with a war fighting problem because he saw the exact same things that I saw. And he was much better at it. I, I cannot take any credit for what he came up with because this guy was brilliant. Uh, he was a warrior. He, he basically wrote the book for the world on how to use aircraft as a power. He was a mechanical engineer. He was a historian. He was a philosopher. But the problem is he never published anything. I don't know if, how many of you have done thesis work or dissertation work, but imagine going up to your committee and saying, I want to use this as a source. Oh, where was it published? Nowhere. It was a fight. Anyway. We got through that, and what he found was amazing. And I want to share that with you guys just a little bit. And what he said was it comes down to looking at a problem in a new way. And this was the example that he would give people. And he would say, first, pick four objects. And he would pick these four objects, a tank, a bicycle, a boat, and a skier. And he says, if you break them down to the constituent parts, of each item and you broke them down and you look at the parts, now you can look at it a different way. You can look at the blend, the parts from each component 
and you can start putting things together that's something unique and something different and something that people haven't seen before. And so when you put them back together again, when you look at these four items separately, you don't really envision this. But if you look at the parts, you can. And what else can you come up with? That was his whole uh, spiel was, wow, if we look at the problem by destroying what we know first, putting things back together again in a different way, we could have a very unique solution that somebody else doesn't have. And I think this was brilliant. It was a great um, example that he presented. So we have a hacker example. The Jeep Cherokee of 2014, 2015, most defenders are aware of this. Um, they took radio signals and a car and a highway and cell phone technology and laptop technology, and they were able to cobble all these parts. They broke them all apart. They put them all back together. And what they did was scared the hell out of some driver when they took control of the person driving the Jeep Cherokee, driving the stereo up, uh, unlimited windshield wiper fluid. They could actually drive the car. And people said, well, that was just with the Jeep, except the, the guys who did this, and I forget their names at the moment, um, the guys that did this said, well, it was only a Jeep because that was the vehicle we had. If we had a different vehicle, we would have hacked that. So you have to think about this. It's like, wow, that is truly a hacker. They destroyed everything down to its constituent components. Then they put it back together again in a whole new way, in a kinetic way that could cause harm. So Boyd, when he was looking for this, he was looking for a solution. So he saw the history, he saw what could happen, and he wanted to move uh, destruction and creation into a better uh, solution. And so he looked to his own uh, interests and his strengths, and so he looked to primarily military study and physics, the natural world of what was going on in the world. And he couldn't find an answer there. So he looked into the thinking process. And so he developed all these things. He just devoured this material and he could, still couldn't develop a model. He, it did not make sense. So finally, he just started studying everything. And when he started everything, started breaking everything down, he noticed a pattern. And what he came up with was this thing called an OODA loop. And this is what people called it. He never called it the OODA loop, but this is what people called it. And so basically, he said, decision making is uh, of some simple steps here. The first one is observe. You use the five steps of your physical senses to uh, observe the world around you. So you use touch, smell, taste, you know, vision, and you do all that so that way you can uh, uh, collect data personally as a person. Then it's orientation. That's the next step. You take all that, all those inputs and you use the analysis and synthesis of data. So you break all that data down, you put it all back together again to create your own mental perspective on how you are sitting in this world, in this situation. How do you fit? We call this orientation. Do you know where you are? Do you know where your enemy is? Do you know where the world is? and so forth, orientation. And he says, once you have your orientation, you gotta make a decision. What am I gonna do to, am I gonna stay in this one spot? Am I gonna move a spot? Am I gonna do anything? And you had to make a choice. You had lots of choices available to you. And then once you made a decision, you, you had to act. You know, everyone remembers from back in the day, probably GI Joe, you know, knowing is half the battle. Well, the other half is action. You actually have to do something. So that's what he said. And he said the cycle starts all over again. The problem is, this is not what he presented to people. This is what people have watered down over the years. This is not his loop. Okay, this is how people understood it. He would brief this loop, it would take him 13 hours, and people would only, after 13 hours, they would start to understand what he was talking about. And when you look at this, there's no way you would say this would take 13 hours to brief. 
this is his loop. It still has the four general components. However, you can see that the interactions and the chain is a lot more complicated than what people present. And so that becomes, wow, how do we digest this? And to me, that's a very good question. We'll talk some more here. So my goal was to develop a theory. So my goal for my dissertation was I'm going to create a theory. I'm going to say hackers, I want to say hackers are following a decision-making theory. Something is happening in that black box that makes them more successful than the defenders because they're always getting through and the defenders, you know, are sometimes successful. Now, how do we do a starting point? Well, that was a big debate over whether or not uh, I should be developing a theory because uh, that's hard. So what we elected on was to do case study and continuous evaluation. And so I went over to the uh, Pacific Rim uh, cyber defense competition and I got to observe the three-day competition. I got to watch the 40 hackers that they had or pen testers um, attack college students. And I got to sit there and watch them and observe them. I couldn't interfere, but I could watch and take notes. And I took a lot of notes. Also, many of them would record their screen activity. Some did not because it slowed down their activity, so they turned off the recorder. But for the most part, I got more than 100 hours of screen activity, and I got to use that to compare to the notes that I took. And on top of that, the hackers allowed me to interview them. But I only asked them one question because I'm developing theory. I don't want to have any preconceived notions of what they might answer. So I only asked them one question. How did you achieve success during the contest? And the answers, the average response was about 30 minutes because they, they just had this wealth of information of how what they felt and what they saw and what they remember. the, the uh, um, observe phase, all their senses were being used. And then the orientation phase, well, this is what I think they were doing. This is what I wanted to do. This is how I wanted to get deeper in their system, so on and so forth. So that, so the responses were great. What I did was I built four models um, because uh, depending on, on what the result was and how I triangulated that data, but when I had the four models, I looked at them and I was like, you know, these are really all the same model, except some people were in this step a lot longer, so it looked different. So this is what I came up with. And if you notice, it looks very similar to the OODA loop. This is where I learned about the OODA loop right here. When I had a four-step process that I developed and I said, hey, there's got to be somebody who's done this already. And that's when I started learning about uh, Colonel Boyd and his OODA loop. So I developed four decision-making models, then I merged them into one uh, final model. And this model, it shows that, hey, they are looking for gathering, they're gathering information on their target. Then sometimes if they saw an opening, they immediately took action. Other times they would just kind of file it away um, for later. But Basically, it was, I'm going to attack this. If it fails, I'm going to go scan some more ports. If it's successful, then I'm going to establish persistence. If they established persistence, there was only two actions that they would take at that point. They would either hack deeper, trying to gain escalation of their persistence, or they would just try to take action against the target to bring it down. So it was pretty much a solid four-step process of the OODA loop. The fact that they would go deeper is itself remnants of the full OODA loop because the OODA loop is not a one loop decision making cycle. It happens at the tactical level, it happens at the uh, strategic level, and everywhere in between. So the hackers are doing this. The kicker is that um, we now have an opportunity to pursue this research further. The hackers can do 
uh, we can study what the hackers are actually doing. We have a basis. We got something to compare it to. We can prove it right. We can prove it wrong. We can e expand the model. We can uh, say, hey, Matt was full of crap. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Great, but we have something. The strategic security community has something that they can compare and build on. That's what we have at the end of this. The implications are not only is it a starting point for further research, it is uh, an amazingly break from the three stovepipe approach that has been done so far. The hackers were oblivious. They did not know that they were using the OODA loop. By the time I did the interviews, because that was several months after the activity, um, because I wanted to do some synthesis of the uh, information so that way I'd have follow-up questions. But by the time I asked them, I actually asked them about the OODA loop, they never heard of it. One guy did hear of it, but he had no idea what it was. He said, yeah, I heard of something like that, but I couldn't tell you what it means. Oh, okay, that's cool. So if they're doing this intuitively, what would happen to us as defenders if they were trained to do it explicitly? The problem is the OODA loop only works in offense. It's kind of like soccer, right? If you play defensive only, you'll never score a goal. Therefore, you never win. Therefore, the best you can get is a tie. But the OODA loop only works in offense. So that means the hackers are the only ones who can attack. So therefore, they're always going to win, which is what's happening now. Again, we solved this problem of how hackers are winning. They're the only ones attacking. And I know there's exceptions to that rule. Yes, I'm aware. But generally speaking, if you're having a business, you're putting up walls and trying to keep them from being penetrating your credit card information and stuff like that. But eventually they will get through. That's expected. You know, we've started changing our philosophy around what, 2002, 2005, where work through the downtime instead of just turning everything off. So now we're trying to ex gain more acceptance that, hey, you know what? We're going to get penetrated. What are we going to do when that happens? How are we going to react? This understanding that the hackers are using the OODA loop intuitively fundamentally changes defense strategies. It really does. Because once we know what they're doing and how they're doing it and how they're achieving it, what are we doing to counter it? We need to look at hackback strategies. And I know some people have looked into this before, but really the laws that are put in place prevent many of the defenders from hacking back. You can't, you can defend yourself by putting up a shield, but you can't defend yourself by taking out the guy who's attacking you. So that makes things very problematic for defenders. So can the defenders at all leverage the OODA loop? That is a very good question. One that I've been working for the last month on. So if hackers are oblivious to the OODA loop, and we could be trained to do the OODA loop, what would that look like? Well, this is what it looks like now. The hackers are using the OODA loop to their advantage and the defenders constantly just put up more walls, more delays, and they hope for the best. And that's really how it's coming down to. I, mean, I know it's an oversimplification, but this is what's happening. When I submitted this talk, uh, one of the reviewers recommended I read uh, this book here. This book is amazing. This Analog Network Security uh, presented by Wen. He is awesome. I, I got a hold of him last week and we're talking now about how his research and my research go together. I also kind of uh, enjoyed his information because um, I grew up doing electronics first and working on vacuum tube radio. So when he talked about analog security, I knew exactly what he was talking about because I also worked in the analog electronics field for a long time. His, uh, his idea is that protection is not infallible. Your protection is only as good 
as how long it takes to detect the entrance of an attacker and how long it takes you to react to that guy, to either get him out of your system um, in some way. And I think this is a very uh, uh, complicated concept that he simplified very nicely. So he said, look, if your protection is, uh, you can protect your network for a maximum of three days because it'll take you three days to defend against it and your response is to turn off the ports, then that's what your protection level is. Unfortunately, you know, that is here and there because even, oh, what, two years ago, the number of days that someone was in your network was over 200 days. And now it's dropped to like 56, but it's not because they can't sit in your network for that long. It's because they're not patient enough to do so. They just drop a ransomware bomb and go on. We still haven't stopped them from penetrating and sitting in our systems. So uh, his, his wins formula on this is very much accurate, but we're being defeated all the time. People that have implemented the OODA loop in the past, they emphasize speed. And the thing is, is it isn't necessarily the speed of the OODA loop. Boyd would always equate the OODA loop to turning in an aircraft. He was a pilot. And so he would say, hey, I can get through the OODA loop faster than you. So therefore, I will always defeat you in the air. And But it's not like a, a CD-ROM or, or a DVD where the person on the inside is traveling the OODA loop faster than the person on the outside. It's the orientation phase that Boyd was able to get through faster. He was able to make a better picture of what the environment that he was in was, and his picture was accurate. And because he was able to do that quickly, then he was able to decide and act faster than the other person who either got their orientation wrong or they were still working on establishing their orientation while he was acting. And his act changed the orientation and they would have to go all the way back to uh, observe so that way they could figure out where Boyd was at now. So it was the orientation phase where the speed was occurring. It wasn't just a simple matter of I went through these four steps faster than you. It was a convoluted, uh, uh, multifaceted activity that occurred. So that brings us back to World War I and the aircraft of World War I, where you had two people, two fighter pilots, basically running through the same OODA loop. Remember, they're only going about 80 miles an hour. They're not going very fast. People drive faster than these planes were flying back then. They both were working with the same technologies of aircraft. And yeah, there was leaps and bounds in both sides in the war, but generally speaking, their wooden aircraft with paper wings, with small engines, because they didn't have the materials to build bigger engines. And they were doing everything from shooting shotguns at each other to mounting machine guns, but they still had to get within spitting distance to do any damage. So their OODA loop was pretty much similar. However, comma, their orientation differed. The Red Baron would only engage in activity if his orientation favored his success. So think about that. The Red Baron with 80 kills it was just destroying um, the enemy, but yet they shared the same sort of OODA loop because the technology was the same and the tactics were the same. All right. So where does this leave us? So if we combine the OODA loop theory of the, of the attackers with the OODA loop theory that is put out by Wynn, what we have here is that the OODA loop is your security umbrella. And that identifies how secure you are against detection and response. And so those two formulas go back together. So the top formula there is the, is the WINS formula. Then we have, he breaks it down into the, the OODA loop into this sort of formula. And then he combines the two into one section. And the image is there's OODA loops inside of OODA loops inside of OODA loops. This never ends this decision-making process. So it makes things very interesting. So after all that, where are we at? 
we're here. I took the three major stovepipes of cybersecurity, the technology, the law, and the psychology, and I threw it in a blender and just destroyed it all. And what came out was that we needed a multidisciplinary approach to research and for defense of our networks. And I'm not the first one that came up with that. I just came up with a basic model. There has been calls for this multidisciplinary research approach for years. And what happens is nobody did anything with it. Well, here's a starting point I gave you. The hackers are using the, the OODA loop. And we can combine that with time-based security. And maybe we can build a better defensive strategy against the hackers where the amount of hackers actually decrease instead of increase. But I don't know. That's for somebody else to do the research on. Or if I get time, I will pursue that. But at least now, right now, we have a brand new starting point that isn't filled with 30 years of dogma. Folks, you can email me. You can get on my LinkedIn if you want to. I, I'm not cool enough to have a Twitter or anything like that. But you can contact me here. Are there any questions? I can make the slides available. I don't mind sending them. Send me an email, I'll send them to you. I don't know if Hacker Halted has a repository for the slides, but I'm happy to share them. Any other questions? That's a very good question. Uh, when when and I are discussing that, we've only been talking back and forth for about a week. Uh, he thinks the OODA loop could be used to extend the time uh, it would take for a hacker to penetrate and do something. So he thinks you, if you use the OODA loop as a defender, you could extend your security time. It'll never be an impenetrable wall, but if you make your uh, your security tougher to beat than somebody else's, the hackers will move on. And that's kind of where we're talking right now. He's looking at the research that I came up with, and we're going to spend some time talking over the next few months to, to see, you know, because honestly, um, you know, I, I can't make these decisions in a vacuum. I need other people to say, hey, Matt, you're an idiot, or hey, Matt, have you thought of this? So uh, we're working on that. I do not have any websites or practice modules for detecting, uh, practice detecting. Um, my students that I work with, uh, they are afraid of computers and I'm trying to break down that barrier. So unfortunately I don't get to do the high level stuff, but I really get to help a lot of kids get into the cyber arena, um, which is what we really need. Like I said before, we got 1.2 million job openings right now. And I'm trying to fill that with people that don't know, wouldn't normally be IT people, uh, and they are coming up uh, through our ranks at our college. Okay. Well, you're more than welcome to email me or uh, talk about me. And I think they're posting this recording. I said that's free to go. And uh, I will have the slides. If you send me an email, I'll be happy to send them back to you. And if Hacker Halted wants the slides, I'll happy to give them the slides as well. All right, folks. Thanks for listening to me. And I hope to meet you guys in person one day.